Buenos dias. <laughs> um, and Matilde is joining us as an Action with Love ambassador. Matilde Denning is a professional animal communicator, a healer, author and teacher in the art of animal connection and author of two books. She strongly believes it's her role to help translate the communication between animals and their guardians or the humans that surround them. Matilda has worked many years professionally as a communicator and healer, teaching workshops and education, first in Denmark, where she grew up, now also in Holland and in Belgium, in order to study biology and animal behaviour. She believes that everyone has skills and talents with them that can help the animal kingdom and believes that communication and healing tools are available to all to better understand and connect deeper with our own animals and the animals around us. Her passion to help animals and people to understand each other and to find harmony in their shared presence and her hope is to help create greater empathy, presence and mutual understanding between we humans and the beings we share this earth with. So please welcome Matilde Denning for her presentation, The Intuitive Animal Guardian, Listen to Them Speak. Welcome Matilde. Thank you so much, Marie. It's so nice to see all of you. Uh, please bear with me if my English is not the best. If I, if I say something you don't understand, please just ask. <laughs> it's not uh, yeah, my first language. But uh, I'm really excited to be sharing the presentation with you guys today. It's the first time I'm giving this uh, exact talk. Um, it's about a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. Because as Marie said, I work as an animal communicator and healer. But my big joy is to actually show that everyone has these intuitive abilities inside of them and guide people to use them more and more. Uh, I feel like even people who are trained within this energy field have a tendency of maybe restricting when they're using it. And I want us all to use it all the time, basically, as much as possible. So I have collected uh, some stories today of not only helping pets in my work, but also helping wild animals I meet or um, animals in zoos and other places where I run into animals and how we can actually use some of these energetic tools to help them and to make a better living for them. Uh, Cause I've loved animals ever since I was a kid, but always been frustrated with the limitations of being able to help them. I try to be an intern as a vet and in a pet store and as a horse trainer and constantly ran into this disappointment of not feeling like I was doing enough for the pets, that it was not possible to help them the way I wanted to help them. So I have been collecting some energetic tools and I'm excited to share them with you guys today and hopefully give you a feeling of how you can also use these in your everyday and with all the animals you might run into. If you have any questions, please feel free. I can't see all your videos at once. Um, so either write it down and I'll make sure we have some time at the end or otherwise you at least need to unmute yourself during the presentation as I can't see all of you. Oh, so I wanna start by telling a story of this chicken who came into my life. Uh, she came from an animal shelter where she was found in the streets and I took her in and she lived with me and my horses. And one day when I was on a vacation all the way in India, uh, the caretaker of my animal sent me a text saying that she was unable to move, that she was just lying on the ground and that she didn't uh, want to eat anything or drink anything and they didn't know what had happened. Luckily, I was coming home the, the following day and since I'm used to traveling quite a bit, I made contact to her from a distance and I told her that I would be coming home. I told her that she could feel safe and that I would take care of it as soon as I came home. So basically to stay put and this ability to contacting my own animals when I'm at a distance has helped me in so many different situations. And it's really something I will encourage all of you to do simply to see a picture of your animal. You have such a strong bond with your own animals, simply imagining your own pet and recalling the feelings you have for this pet and you will be connected immediately. 
you'll be able to pass on some messages. So that's what I did. I told her to not worry, I'll be there. And the following day when I saw her, I immediately felt that her leg was broken uh, and she was really scared. I told her I had to take her to the vet, but she was frightened that if she went with me to the vet, she would not come home. So I had to promise her that no matter what the vet said, I would bring her back home again. So we took her to the vet and the vet did an x-ray on her. And it was the first time he ever did an x-ray on a chicken, <laughs> but uh, I forced him to. And he did find out that she actually had multiple fractions in one of her legs and said that there was no way he could operate it and that she had to be put down. But I told him I promised to take her home. So I brought her back home. Uh, three days of painkilling is what I got to make a decision about it. And I really didn't know what to do. So I went home and I asked for guidance simply to the universe saying, please give me some guidance. And the following day, luckily, I was remembered that I work at an animal shelter and there they have a special technique for uh, prey birds that they put them in a box when they break a leg and they hang them in a towel like you can see in the picture on the upright corner and they sit there until their leg has basically healed. And I thought, well, that's the idea the universe is giving me. I guess I have to go with it. So I taped her up, I put her here, and for three weeks she lived in my living room like this. And I had absolutely no idea whether it was working or not. I was just crossing my fingers, checking in with her, really low practical things like what does she want to eat? Because at some point she stopped eating. So then I had to give her some different food. At one point she got a worm infection from sitting there and she was constantly guiding me on how to take better care of her. And I was checking in with her regularly if she felt like she was ready to try to stand on the leg or not. And after three and a half weeks, she told me that she was ready. And I took her to the vet for another x-ray scan. I was pretty nervous because going against the vet's order of putting her down and then bringing her back for another x-ray <laughs> takes some guts. Uh, but I did it and he was astonished that she had completely healed. Her leg was completely fine. Then I could bring her home and we started retraining like you see in the lower right corner, training her slowly, getting strength back in her leg. And she continued to live happily, jumping and running around after this episode. And for me, she was such a teacher in why it was so important for me to use my intuitive abilities to keep asking her to check in with her wisdom, to listen to her body instead of following the authorities. And this is something I'm extremely passionate about because we have a lot of great authorities out there to help us, but we also sometimes get a bit blinded by them. My message for you today is really this. We pet owners are capable of much more than we give ourselves credit for. We don't need to lean on authorities all the time. It's good to have people we trust that can give us a second opinion always, but always tune into your gut feeling before you make any decisions about your animals for multiple reasons, but amongst others, because science has, science has actually proven to us that the people who are best suited at understanding the pets around them and getting communicating true to them is the pet owners themselves. The stronger we are connected to our animals, the easier it is for us to communicate and to receive information. And we do this all the time. I hope to give you some inspiration on how to do this a bit more in your everyday. But first, let me talk about what I see an intuitive pet guardian actually is. So if you can say yes, please raise your hand to when I read out these lines, if you can agree with some of this. So have any of you ever had a feeling that something might be wrong with your animal? <laughs> I knew this was a good group to ask. Have you ever felt chosen by an animal in your life? Yeah. Did you ever have a gut feeling about something that your animal needed, different food, a different home or anything like that? Yeah. Um, let me just see. Do you ever speak out verbally to your animal or reply on the behalf of your animal? <laughs> yes. Nice. Did you ever feel a special connection to an animal in your life? Beautiful. And then the non-animals related, have you ever felt an atmosphere when stepping into a room? Or ever been impacted by other people's emotions around you? Yeah, nice. 
Well, if you can agree with some of them, and it seems that almost all of you agree to all of them, you are already an intuitive pet owner, and it's really just about stepping into that role and making the most out of it. So how does this actually work? Well, I always think of it as all animals, all beings always emit energy from them. Like when they have a thought, when they have an emotion, when they have a wish for anything, they are emitting an energy. And that energy is a bit like a barcode we see in the grocery stores. It has a specific uh, code or frequency. And when we use our intuition, we just get in touch with this energy. We will translate the barcode into, for example, a thought in our head, hmm, maybe our cat needs more food, or it could be a feeling in our body, oh, I'm feeling hungry, maybe my cat needs some food. It could be an image in our head, I see an empty food bowl, maybe we need some more food. So it can come through many different channels when we receive it, but it's all been translated by our intuition as soon as we get in contact with the energy that the animal is emitting. Does this make sense to you guys? Just raise a hand. Cool. Yeah. So it's really a skill about reading the energetic messages that are constantly around us. You guys who said that you have ever been impacted by emotions or could read an atmosphere, it's exactly the same. You step into a place, you get in contact with the energy and it will impact you. And for some of us, we are more sensitive to it than others. I'm sure a lot of the people sitting here are very sensitive to it can probably fall sick if we eat food who, which has an energy that we don't really need or can feel completely drained with people who have an energy that doesn't match ours. So we are all specialized in reading these energetic messages and that's what's happening between us and our animals all the time. Whenever they have a thought or an emotion, it's available to us. And by tapping into their energy field, their aura or their personal space, or even doing that intuitively, just contacting them, we will get messages about what they're feeling and what their experiences. As I said, it can come through many different channels. So we can all be in contact with the same animal and I might receive it as a mental picture and Deborah might receive it as words inside her head. Fiona might receive it as a feeling in her body or Julia might receive it as an emotion. So it's really important to know that this uh, messages, these messages coming from the animals don't have a, a permanent form because I thought that when I started tapping into the energy, I thought, oh, it's like when I order an animal communication, someone will come and they will say words inside my mind and I will hear that it's from some outer place that it comes. Well, not quite because it's really our own intuition translating the energy and therefore it will feel like our own emotions it will sound like our own words it will be like we have pain a specific place where the animal have pain and thereby we really become the tool in order to translate these messages and that takes a bit of self-awareness because we need to know what is me and what is the animal mm. all good everyone yeah, please, if you want me to stop, just like make a something and I will ask you. <laughs> so I always claim that we are all born with this skill. And of course, for some of us, it's more developed than others. We all have the skill of intuition because we use that in, well, if we were like free, what do you say, more normal, <laughs> nature living people not so impacted by society we would use our intuition to constantly feel what is right what is wrong is this a good decision to make or will it put me in danger and this is what the animals are absolutely amazing at they can constantly feel will this make me stronger was this too good for me will this be a dangerous situation or is it safe for me so they constantly navigate in their life through intuition and we are meant to do the same but we become distance from our intuition as soon as we step into society and we are told don't make uh, decisions with your heart or with your intuition, make decisions with your brain, be able to explain it, be able to use your logic to tell me why you're doing what you're doing. So society is really training us to, to go away from our intuition. And that is really a pity because our intuition has so much knowledge for us. And in order to really connect with our animals, I believe we have to regain that trust in our intuition, in the wisdom of the intuition, because that's where our animals live. And that also means we need to regain some trust in ourselves. We need to rely more on our own knowledge instead of the knowledge that are coming from the outside, from the society or from the logic and trust that that intuitive noise or voice inside us, ourselves are actually to be trusted. Yeah. 
so I want to tell some stories and uh, I hope you all will enjoy them. Um, stories of how I'm using these energetic tools and how I'm using the intuitive no knowledge that I'm uh, getting from the animals. On my animal education, well, where I teach them, teach my students animal communication, I always bring them to the zoo. And a lot of people have, um, they don't want to join me when I go to the zoo because they feel the pain of the animals and they feel sad for the animals sitting in cages. But I also see that there is a lot we can do for the animals in the zoo and we can help them in specific ways. So at this specific day, I had a, a student who was really feeling down. She was crying because she felt the pain of the animals and she actually wanted to leave. But I asked her if she could stay a bit longer and tell me which of the animals in the zoo that she actually resonated the most with. And she picked this gorgeous tiger, which name was Luna. And it was pretty clear that Luna was not a happy tiger. Um, she would scare off everyone who came to watch her at her cage and she would pee on any guest who stepped too close to her in order to get her own personal space. But there was also a lot of anger and sadness from her. And my student really resonated with that because she was in a very painful place in her own life. So the first thing we did was just sitting outside her cage and she was hiding. Like I hadn't seen this tiger. I've been at the zoo multiple times and never see her come out of her cage. So we couldn't actually see her, but we just started connecting with her, sending her a ray of love, of energy. And the first thing I got was that we had to stop calling her Luna because that's what all the tourists were calling her. Everyone watching her, she wanted a new name. So we called her Starlight instead. And then I asked my student to just close her eyes and visualize that this beautiful tiger would step out of her cage. And as we were sitting there, she actually came out of her cage, as you can see her lying here right in front of us. And uh, I asked my student to visualize that she showed this tiger the worst pain in her own life and the tiger would in return show the pain that she was experiencing. And there was a lot of loss and a lot of sorrow and just sadness in general, feeling alone, feeling angry. And there was emotions from both my student and from the tiger. So then I asked them both to compliment each other on the sharing and create a bond where they could support each other even at a distance, seeing themselves healing and seeing the other uh, individual healing. And it was such a, such a strong... Um, experience for both of us because as we were sitting there she started cleaning herself like this completely calm instead of chasing people away she even rolled onto her back lying exposing her belly which is really vulnerable for for tigers so we were not expecting that at all and just really connecting with us and saying thank you for us to share that pain with her and before leaving, we, of course, sent a lot of light to her home because she was very sad about being in this cage, seeing a lot of light entering her cage. And then we talked with one of the zookeepers who told us that the reason why she was so angry with everyone and especially with people was that her brother had tried to escape and they had shot him right in front of her eyes. And in the process, they had hit her as well. And that's why she had to have her tail removed. So she was extremely upset with everyone. Uh, but as we left, she was calling us back, like roaring at us, asking us to return. And my students tell me that up to this day, they still have contact, still supporting each other. And that makes me happy every single day. So the first lesson is, well, we all carry energy. We are all energy. And we are capable of giving this energy to individuals who need it, like my student who gave love and light to this tiger. So I want you all to please join me trying to make a ball of energy between your hands. So what you do is you start, yeah, I don't know what this is called, rubbing your hands, <laughs> trying to attract energy from your entire being into your hands. And when you feel all your focus and all your energy is in your hand, you can start spreading your hands slowly and see if you can feel the field between your hands. Yeah. For some, it might feel if you push it together that there is resistance or when you stretch, you can almost feel you have to use force to stretch the energy field. If you don't feel anything, please just go again. Start again by making energy between your hands and see if you can make it into this ball. So I really shape it. Yeah. 
Yeah. For some, you can make a big ball. For some, maybe a smaller ball is easier. But just see if you can feel that almost elastic feeling between your hand. This is your energy. And this energy that you are free to pass on to anyone or anything that might need it. So please go ahead and give yourself this energy somewhere where you might find it nice to get a boost of energy. <laughs> nice. Great. I want to uh, please try one more time, create this ball of energy. And this time you can also visualize it. If you find it hard to feel it, you can see the color of it. I want you to fill it with an intention. It could be the intention of healing, of support, of love, pain relief, whatever you feel like. Just call in that intention, focus on it. And then again, try to give it to yourself now with an intention and see if you can feel the difference. So nice seeing all of you play along. Please, uh, the ones of you who are not busy, raise a hand if you could feel the energy between your hands. Oh, please keep it up. I'm just scrolling through all the pages with your beautiful pictures. <laughs> nice. And please raise a hand if you felt the difference between giving yourself the energy with an intention and just without an intention. Yeah, so many energy workers here. Thank you. So this is a very simple tool that we also used with the tiger. You can always send energy either by touching the animal with the energy or simply visualizing this ball of energy transferring to the other being. You can fill it with a specific intention. You can do this for your own pets. They love it. <laughs> if you want it, um, the more uh, concrete an intention you have, the stronger the healing power for that specific part, so to say. Yeah. So healing can take a lot of different forms. And I want to tell a story about a dog I work with. Actually, it was my student who worked with this dog. We were doing healings. And uh, this was a very sweet dog. Uh, she was very gentle, very mild in energy and had a mother, like a motherly energy that was very clear. But my students started to notice that when she was healing on the crown chakra, which is really what represents our life purpose, the dog started to scratch itself in its sacral chakra, which is sitting around the navel, is that what it's called? And which is really connected with hormones and with the feminine and masculine energy parenthood of animals. And every single time she was in contact with this area, the dog would scratch itself. And we found that quite particular because this is how animals communicate to us. They always let us know what is going on if we're just quick enough to pick up on it. So she started to heal these two areas together and she felt a lot of um, unease in the sacral chakra with the hormones. She felt a lot of um, restlessness and a lot of questions coming from the dog. So when we told this to the owner, the owner told us that actually they wanted to have puppies on these dogs, but from one moment to another, it got very sick in its uterus and it had to have it removed. Uh, so it no longer was able to get any puppies, but since then it still had false pregnancies, it had hormonal disturbances, whenever once a month it would go and pick up like teddy bears and put it in its basket and take care of them. So there was a strong urge for this dog to really um, take care of someone and to be a mother. So what we needed to do was redirect this dog and give it an overall because it really thought that its life purpose was to have puppies and it wasn't po possible anymore. 
So we tried to clarify this for the dog and we released the wish for puppies by explaining it wasn't possible anymore. And instead we guided it into a new role of taking care of its family. And as you can see on the picture, this is the happy dog greeting my student after finishing her work. Um, it was really beautiful and touching both how the dog was guiding us on how to help it really. She was so smart explaining to us what was happening in her body and how it was all related and also that she was just really grateful for the work we had done on her. So healing can take many different forms and that is really important because especially within energy work it can fast be thought that healing is really putting your hands on someone sending energy and that is one very physical form of healing but if you ask like different people healing can look different it can be a good conversation or it can be the feeling of being understood or doing things that make us happy and gives us energy caring for our own body so healing can be many different things and for this dog it was really just that she could share what it was that was happening inside of her that was the biggest healing we could give her so sometimes i just ask people to imagine themselves in the pores of the animal how would you feel if you were going through this what would you need? What can you offer? And really take down that wall between us and the animals because we are not that different. And we cannot really do anything wrong because animals feel our intentions and they trust us to do our best as long as we have a pure intention and we are authentic in the work we do. And they will let us know if we're doing the right thing or not. Just like this dog actually showed us that she was really happy with the work and we had helped her. So sometimes just understanding what an animal is going through can be healing enough and this can be done with the zoo animals or any other animal that you might need. Uh, I want to tell another story about what it's like when sometimes what you need to do is just understand what an animal is in need of. <laughs> and that can sometimes be easier said than done. But as I said earlier, I work at an animal shelter. And when we come in, we are really supposed to just take care of the animals, feed them, being in a hurry because there's a lot of animals coming through. And I was sitting with this squirrel one day and she was refusing to eating at all. She wouldn't eat. And well, normally we have to do our best to make them eat. And if they don't eat, we have to just put them down and try again later because there's no time for, for really stopping up. But I really felt that what she needed was to understand what was happening. She was really confused and fearful of being here. She didn't know why she was here. And I sensed this in my own body as an emotion of this confusion and fear. So I took the time to just be present with her and really show empathy that I understood what she was going through and telling her what would happen and within a few minutes she's starting to eat again and I was really happy of course to be able to help her so sometimes the best we can do is actually just understanding what the animal need might not be food or practical caretaking but actually just to spend some time or understand what is happening so I always encourage people to use their intuition to try to feel each animal that they're working with. And of course, for that, I have a small exercise for you. So I'm gonna show you a picture of two animals. When I show you the picture of the first animal, please note down what are the first things you think about, the emotions that come up in you, the words that show up for you, write them down and I'll show you the second picture. And then we will, well, I will tell you what the owner used to describe this animal and you can see how well your words fit this. You okay with that? Yeah. So please trust your first instinct. And remember what I said in the beginning, that it can come through thoughts, feelings, physical sensations. I see a lot of you guys smiling. That could also be a hint. So I'll show you the second picture.
Okay. So since you're all muted, I'm just going to tell you the words that what, what I got and what the owners say about the animals. And please, I'm not looking for you guys to have the same words, but just in the same category, if you picked up on the same energy, so to say. So for the first dog, I got the words playful, caring, goofy, a very light energy, free, excited, and a very loving, <laughs> love me and I will love you back energy. How many people think that this is kind of what they got as well? Lift a hand. Yeah, well done, guys. Good job. For the second dog, I had authority, protection, clarity, overview, grounded, protecting, and worried. How many people think they got something similar? Yeah, nice job, guys. How many people think that the second dog was more difficult than the first one? Uh, some of you guys, cool. So this um, ability to tap into an energy pretty quick and get some first insights can be really useful, both when we work with our own pets, always trust that gut feeling, the first instincts that come up in you, but also when we work with wild animals, zoo animals, whatever comes to you. If you got a feeling about something, please go ahead with it because more often than not, you will be correct. It's really about being able to step into the present moment, into the now, because this is where the animals are. We have a lot of different voices inside of us, which makes a lot of noise, which includes our logic, our fear, our um, wishes <laughs> and so on and it's all disturbing us all the time that's why some of our animals end up using earplugs like uh, metaphorical earplugs because they feel like we are so noisy and they are not this noisy uh, i remember one time i was asked in the beginning of my animal communication training to simply ask an animal one question which was how are you doing today and I just didn't understand why I never got anything back until I realized that as soon as I'd asked the question, how are you doing? My mind would be like, what are you up to? Please tell me something. I'm doing this training. Can you please give me some kind of information? What is it you're saying? Tell me, come on, come on. <laughs> so that noise constantly in my head, not allowing any kind of space for actually receiving uh, anything back from the animal. So it really takes being present where we stop thinking and we're just present. For me, I know I'm present when I remember whether or not I locked the door or where I put my keys or if I closed the fence. I know what my body is needing. I know my mood without having to stop and actually think about it first. Being quiet doesn't necessarily mean that we're standing still sitting in a meditation, but the real test is can I be quiet while I'm doing things, while I'm with my animal, while I'm being active. Because it is needed, animals are always present. So in order to be at the same frequency like them, it's a bit like tapping into a radio station and finding the right frequency. That's how it is. When we find the right frequency, the intuitive information can come easier. So a good uh, practice for you guys who wants to practice stepping into the now is to listen to your bodies. Stop maybe two, three, four times a day and ask your body, is there anything you need? Maybe a sip of water, going to the bathroom, getting some food, because our body is unable to be anywhere else than in this present moment. So many of you guys said in the beginning that Matilda, you to... this is your 10 minute reminder. Thank you. <laughs> many of you guys said in the beginning that you have tried to have animals choosing you and the animals are extremely great at doing this. They can find the people who they need. So this is a great reminder for people who might be struggling with something with their animals at the moment. It's not, um, it's not a coincidence that they have found you. And I got this lesson from a street dog once I was traveling. Uh, it was a street dog who I was just walking down the shopping street and suddenly it came running to me from far at a distance, staring straight at me and stopped right in front of me, not noticing the people I was walking with, just sat down in front of me, looking at me like, okay, come on, woman. <laughs> so I asked it, what is it you want? And I got a strong feeling that it had a lot of pain in its right hind leg. 
So what I did was putting out my hands in front of me, doing that energy bubble I showed you, putting it out, and then seeing the energy falling over the dog. And it was sitting completely still. So I was like, okay, let's test this a little bit. So what I would do was lean a little bit to the side and the dog would follow under my hands and I would go a little to the other side and the dog would follow the energy. And in that way, it was being healed. And as soon as it was done, it just got up, looked at me and then left taking off like, okay, I'm good. Thanks for that. <laughs> Completely aware of what it needed, where it could find the help and when it was ready to leave the situation again. So visualizations are really strong ways of healing like I did with this dog. If any animal ever approaches you, it's because they know you have the ability to help them because they can see this very clearly. What you can do after making this energy bubble I showed you is simply see energy streaming through your hand. I see it as light from the sky going through my hands. Or you can see a specific color surrounding the animal. For example, green is the color of healing. So when I see an animal who is suffering and I can't get to it, I simply see this green energy around it. So I know that it's being healed. I can imagine the body of the, as like the area on the body healing completely like this dog's leg. I can see the pain disappearing and transforming into butterflies flying away or something else like that. I can imagine calling in a guide and whatever you work with, angels, animal spirits, whatever it is that talks to you, you can call in a guide to assist this animal. And you can see the energy in the body like small rivers flowing through the body again. All good visualizations that you can use whenever you need an, meet an animal who are in need of some healing. Hmm. I think due to time, I will skip this one and I'll go to this one, the donkey who hated his home. <laughs> so this is my uh, a story about a donkey I met at a zoo and he was really upset being there. He was chasing away everyone and he was very restlessly wandering and he would just bite after everyone who passed this enclosure. So what I did was, um, well, I always carry crystals with me. So I put down a crystal at the outside of his entrance and it was a, um, is it called a mountain crystal? The white ones that cleans energy. Well, I put it outside of his gate and I just imagined this space around him with no sounds, no energy, so that no people who pass could enter this space. It was a bit of a protected bubble. And what he did was he went straight to the middle of his enclosure and he just laid down sleeping instead of chasing people. <laughs> So we can do so much with very little tools and even without being able to maybe physically remove the animal from the situation they are in. If the energy is in a space, this is what you can do. You can start by cleansing the energy of like the house or let's say the enclosure or wherever the animal is. You can use smudge sticks for this, crystals or simple visualizations. Like I imagine that the entire place is covered in rain. So all the negative energy is raining away. Then we can add new energy, which will be good for the animal, like good crystals or smells against smudge sticks, decorations that hold a good intention. Uh, something that can hold up this good energy and at the end we can protect that energy either by calling in a guide or helping again or imagine this strong energy field like I did with the donkey that will hold this energy up high. So this is a good way of trying to help an animal in a place where we might not be able to remove them from the situation by simply lifting the energy in that place instead. Most importantly, keep it simple. <laughs> My boyfriend is a great teacher of mine. He does not do animal communication, but he helps me with my animals. And uh, I have chickens and this chicken in particular, she likes to wake up early in the morning. So she had started calling earlier and earlier at six o'clock, five o'clock, waking us up. And since we have neighbors, that is a bit stressful. And I would run out of bed, letting her out so that she wouldn't wake up anyone. And in the meantime, I would try to make up a plan. Like what kind of thing could I offer her for her to stop waking us up in the morning? And while I was trying to work on this spectacular plan of giving her special food or maybe more in an interaction or something like that, my boyfriend asked me one day, have you noticed that she stopped screaming in the morning? And I said, huh, now that you mentioned it, yes, she did stop. And he said, yeah, I had simply asked her if she could stop because it's annoying for us and we will always let her out in the morning. <laughs> 
And that was all it took. <laughs> Making a very good reminder that as long as we keep it simple, we do it from a pure intention and we explain why we're doing what we're doing. The animal wants to work with us, okay? Don't make it more complicated what you're capable of at the moment. You don't need to have a big healer background. It's great if you have, but you can do so much with the abilities that you already have, like my boyfriend proving to me. So what to avoid? Try not to be too busy in your mind when you're doing this. Try to just be present with the animals. Try not to have a need to analyze in order to trust. You don't need to understand the messages you receive, like that street dog coming up to me. I don't have to understand how it finds me, what it, how it knew that I was able to help it. I just trust that the animals approaching me know that what I can do. Try not to mistrust yourself. I told you about these stories where the animals actually show me afterwards that I have helped them by how they behave but have faith that what you have done for the animals is helpful already. Don't expect too much. Don't expect it to look in a particular way or for the animal to react in a specific way because they all do what they need to do. Don't try too hard, keep it simple. And instead, what you should try to remember is the animals are always communicating with us. They are masters at energy and they know what you can and cannot do. They are always answering and responding to us and our energy, what we do, what we send out, even just a good intention for an animal that you meet in the street that is suffering, saying, I see you and I love you and I wish you the best. That is what they feel. They feel all this energy. So you're never done anything in vain. You can never do too small a gesture. Last thing, we all pick up information differently and thereby have different strengths. Even if you don't feel you're not able to feel this energy bubble, see if you can imagine it, see if you can feel it with your emotions. We are all different in how we receive the energy, but that only makes us different in what we can do for the animals and not limited in what we can do, but just different strengths of what we can do. Really hope to leave you all with this feeling that together we can change the world one random act of kindness at a time for the animals that we meet out there. Hmm. I think we have like one or two minutes. <laughs> if anyone has yeah. asked a one, Yeah, one minute remaining. Does anybody have any questions? Just maybe time for one. If I mean, we, they can always meet in Matilda in the breakout room, can they as well at lunchtime? Or is that possible? Um, um, Marie, I'm only watching on replay after this, so I will not be. In a okay. Break room. Sorry. Yeah. I'll be happy to answer a question if anyone has anything. Has anybody got anything? Oh, you've put, I think they're all sort of mesmerised my tilting. Perfect. <laughs> but um, oh, thank you so much, Matilda. And I like, oh, sorry, um, Karuna, you need to unmute. Let me see. I can ask to unmute you. I got it. Sorry, um, when you said um, a mountain crystal, did you mean quartz, the clear, the clear? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Karuna. And um, we just had a message from Donna Hamer to everyone. Oh, it's just gone off. But I think it said a really clear. Uh, thanks, Matilda, Jane, Jeffrey. Uh, great presentation. Very clear way of communication. Um, so that's super. Because uh, Karuna is going some. Because really, that's what people need. Uh, Sue Southern loved your presentation. Thank you because so many are frightened. Fabulous, simple way of communicating. Wow, there's so many messages in it <laughs> that we near clear. And I agree with you, you know, that we're all capable of communicating. And it's just making those simple steps because wow, our world changes when we communicate with them, doesn't it? Yeah. It completely yeah. deepens everything, the world around us and the connection. Oh, Matilda, thank you again. I mean, to wait two years and I can't even give you a hug. No. 